Welcome back. Well, I recently got a question from one of our viewers about a comment I had made regarding the similarity between 1920s art deco uh, decorative items, particularly porcelain, and 1950s mid-century modern. So I thought we'd talk about that a little today. So, when we get back. Okay, so what's the deal? between 1920s Art Deco and 1950s Mid-Century Modern. Um, yeah, I know. Do, do, you want, do you want them to see you here? There you go. Now they've seen you. Well, for starters, there are a lot of similarities that we're all very clear about. Art Deco was linear. Uh, a lot of lines combined with uh, squares, circles, triangles, geometric shapes. That was a big thing in the 1920s. And in the 1950s, in addition to the organic designs that they had, uh, for example, those boomerang-shaped items. Okay, thank you. I want you. I just, yeah, I needed that tail in my face. They also had the same fondness for geometry. Uh, a lot of the colors were similar, not the same. Uh, you can usually tell the difference between the 1920s colors, which are jazz colors, that's what they were called at the time, um, and of course jazz is music, so I don't know why they were jazz colors, but they were and the 1950s colors, which tended to be more uh, greens, reds, uh, sort of stronger colors, whereas the Art Deco colors tended to come more from nature. Um, so even though you can certainly find reds and greens in nature, greens certainly, uh, the greens and reds you were seeing in the mid-century were a little more, you know, courtesy of Dow Chemical than courtesy of nature as they were in the 20s. I thought we would start by looking at a couple of pieces and these are both by the same company. So let's look at them. All right, the two pieces I just showed you were Royal Hager. Royal Hager uh, has been in business since uh, the latter part of the 19th century. So the entire 20th century, they were churning out goodies. And the first one, the White Gazelle, was Art Deco. That was a piece that they had turned out in, I believe, the late 1920s. The green piece, as you could see, is a television planter. Now, they had, plant, they had planters and lamps like this, and that particular shade of green is a real mid-century shade of green. And these items were designed to sit on top of the television. I swear to you, we did it back then. Um, the television was this new thing in everybody's home and no one knew how to cope with it other than as a piece of furniture. So you stuck a doily on it and you stuck your mid-century like a big sleek black panther or in this case a gazelle. 
Gazelles were totally art deco. That was uh, the gazelle and like the, those big skinny long necked wolfhounds. Those were art deco animals. So showing up, sure, that is a beautiful piece of crossover. But it's not just limited to the 1950s. So let me show you another. And this is one picture, but you will see two different types of images in that picture. Here you go. Okay, that bold geometric painting is uh, one of, of many, many, many uh, by an artist called Mondrian. Um, and he, uh, he did a boatload of them. They all had different names. I can't tell them apart. Uh, that's what they were like. There was a, a black, heavy black grid with primary colored blocks. And that was a huge thing in the 1960s. Now, the 1960s ladies, and for those of us who are alive then, we can date it. That was uh, 1966, we know from the hairstyle. Um, and Yves Saint Laurent took that Mondrian painting, uh, or one of those many Mondrian paintings, because as I say, there were loads of them. He did one, it was popular, he did a boatload more and turned it into a dress. I actually had a dress like that in 1967, even though um, my research now is telling me that dress actually came out in 66, but I had mine in 1967. That was like the late 60s in a nutshell. The big teased up hair, the bold colors, the mini skirts, mm. So when was that painting made? Okay, some of you are already ahead of me. You bet, the 1920s, I swear. So this is why we have this sympathy between the Art Deco style, the mid-century modern, and even, surprisingly enough, going into that uh, Oh, Carnaby Street, 1960s, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. The 1920s, the Art Deco era, gave birth to all kinds of different images that tended to crop up later and recur. And you can see a lot of this uh, just in ordinary life. You look at it, you see the 1920s designs, the Art Deco designs, and you see them coming back again, again, again. The, uh, the sleek lines that were so popular in the 1960s harken back. Uh, that Mondrian, well, I'm tempted to say painting, but as I say, there were many of them. That was hugely popular in the 1960s. I can remember in at least three of my friends' houses seeing different versions of those paintings on the wall in the 1960s. I do not recall ever seeing them in the 1950s, however, and I can assure you that was not something that you were going to see in your nice traditional 1940s living room. I mean, think about that. We've all seen the movies from the 1940s. Can you see that painting sitting in one of those sets? Not hardly. Nevertheless, by then, the painting would have been 20 years old. So, part of the reason is there was a lot of innovation in Art Deco. Things that were just plain ahead of their time. But also, when the 
50s and 60s came along rejecting the overstuffed, sort of comfy, frilly 1940s and early 50s styles. And we've discussed this on other videos. That style in the 1940s and early 50s was a reaction to the chaos of the war. People came back from Europe and they had their little bungalow and they did not want sleek contemporary furniture. They wanted the fluffy armchairs they could curl up in. They wanted comfort. That is also one of the reasons uh, that um, Frank Moss Bennett, and we've spoken about him and his art, uh, he was active between the wars, between World War I and World War II, doing paintings of traditional English hunt scenes. I have a number of them. Uh, I, uh, not his paintings, but prints. Uh, I have a number of his prints. Uh, they're just very, um, well, English hunt scenes. They're perfect for a man cave or a library. You know, you want to throw something on the wall with your books, throw up Frank Moss Hart, or Frank Moss Bennett. I'm sorry, Moss Hart was, and his name wasn't Frank. Moss Hart was somebody totally different, and I don't know why I just sort of grabbed his name. But Frank Moss Bennett, sure, that's what you do when you have a library. That's what you do when you have a man cave. That's what you do when you want to decorate a room with masculine leather furniture. And his paintings, and we discussed this in a previous video, were a reaction to the chaos of war and, of course, the threat of impending war as well. People were hearkening back to another time, a time that was more peaceful and serene and quiet and elegant and you know, here are the horses and the dogs and we're all going to go off to the hunt. So we see this. We see it over and over again after the chaos of the 1960s, which was social upheaval and so on. We had the 1980s, which was colorless and overstuffed. It was neutrals. Remember, the colors were sand and beige and taupe and Everybody's house was decorated in shades of brown, which we kind of look back on and say, well, yeah, gee, I didn't know it at the time, but these all look like a cup of coffee with varying degrees of milk. You know, that's what we turned to because our taste tends to be reactive. Um, I, I kind of wonder what now you know, after 2020, after everything that's going on here and now, what we're going to grab for, um, you know, uh, I would say it's probably not cocooning because we are in enforced cocooning right now. Who knows? Maybe our reaction is going to be something really avant-garde. I mean, I hope so because uh, I love, you know, when art gets cutting edge. But this is why we, we react. And remember, in the 50s and 60s, you're talking about young people who were decorating their homes, buying their stuff. And this is where it becomes important to us as thrifters, collectors, and resellers. They were hearkening back to their grandparents' days or you know, the days of their early childhood and the Art Deco, and they were kind of getting away from um, the sort of cloying comfort that their parents had reacted to in the wake of the war. Um, so, as I say, everything is a reaction to what went before. Some of the reactions are stronger than others, but you see things cycling back. And we saw Art Deco cycling back to us in the 1950s. So how do we tell them apart? How is it that, and let's bring our gazelles back again for a minute.
Okay, how is it we know that the white one is Art Deco and the green one is mid-century modern? Well, for one thing, the lines of that white gazelle are really bold and stark. Uh, it's just, it's white and all it is is that gazelle in basically in silhouette. It's one color. So you have this big, beautiful, bold gazelle. In the 50s, well, we had shades of color. The 50s gazelle, the glazing has more depth. It's, it's shades of green. It's darker in some places, lighter in others. The gazelle is now sort of lounging on the television. Still, it's a gazelle. And remember, a gazelle is as art deco as they come. So, we still see it there. If that were an art deco green, it would have been a jazz color green. And it wouldn't have been this dark, earthy green. The jazz color greens were were stronger. Um, they, as I say, they they felt they were taking their colors from nature. It would have been a clearer green, a sharper green. Um, and interesting thing, while we are talking about this, I'm just going to throw this out because this is an absolutely true story, and it's just fascinating. The reason why menthol cigarettes come in green packages is because when they were first introduced, they were being marketed to women in the late 1920s, but they weren't selling. So, the publicity and marketing departments for the tobacco companies, and as I'm sure you can imagine, they were huge, they had money, they had influence went to fashion designers and began coordinating their efforts. And the fashion designers were saying the new in color is green and the tobacco marketers were saying we are going to change our packages to green and they collectively chose the shades of green when the cigarette packages were matching women's fashions women started buying them. And that's how it happened. And it's a true Madison Avenue story. Uh, and I'm sure there are a million of those because, you know, nothing happens by accident on Madison Avenue. They have way too much money tied up in it for things to just be lucky chances. But that is how menthol cigarettes came to be uh, now, it's, it's sort of goes without saying, a menthol cigarette is in a green package. goes back to grandma's generation when green dresses were hot that year. Anyway, that was a little aside. So I just wanted to give you a little sampling of some of this overlap. And there are ways to tell them apart. There are. When you deal with Art Deco and mid-century items for a long enough period of time, you get a feel for it. But shorthand, the lines are going to be clearer and crisper in the 20s and 30s. They were very interested in the sleek lines, the strong silhouettes. In the 50s, they were more interested in blending into the decor. So you will see things like different degrees of saturation on the glazes. Also, you will see uh, like this gazelle incorporated into a planter, whereas the Art Deco gazelle was simply an ornament that sat by itself and it didn't occur to anybody to stick a flower in it. To this day, I do not know what the 1950s obsession with sticking plants in their sculpture was, 
but it was there. In general, if you find what would ordinarily be considered an art piece, but you're going to show up a plant in it, 1950s through early 60s, that's when they were doing it. They no idea why. I couldn't even begin to speculate. But yes, they wanted a plant on top of their television. They did. They also wanted their uh, little television panthers. Um, and they're generally called TV panthers because the panther is a classic one. They wanted them to light up too. Uh, another th now, that one I get because they really did like technology in the 50s and plugging that panther into the wall and having a light come out of his mouth to them that was cool the plants no not a clue in the world but they did it's their thing all right so i have a couple of things i want to show you before we depart and one is I've got some pet pictures. I've been asking you to send pictures. Uh, and we'll, we'll get into that. That's a whole new kettle of fish. The reason I'm looking for this is because things are not going well out there. I think it would be a good idea if we had some comfort images. So I'm asking for pictures, um, anything. Pictures of your garden, pictures of, the, of your cats. Let's share a little because when we walk away from this, we're still going to have our little bit of quiet sunset because that really is beautiful. It's calm. It's just grounding. But let's put a smile on the faces. So if you've got pictures of kitties, let's see your kitties because who can be upset when you're looking at a picture of a kitty? So, I am going to show you some of those. Here are some kitty pictures. So we got some kitty and puppy pictures, and it's hard to be depressed or unhappy when you got kitties and puppies. Now, I do want your pictures, but I'm having email problems. Um, my uh, URL host, uh, which is where they were in charge of my email, switched over the Labor Day weekend to a new system. They kept sending me emails. We're switching to a new system. Now, mind you, they had said, has nothing to do with you. It's a behind-the-scenes switch. You know, don't worry about it. Well, my email stopped. And apparently, they switched to a new system that will only handle email programs that are Microsoft or Google or the huge ones. And I don't like dealing with the big boys. I would much rather deal with the small open source programs because that's where the cutting edge of technology is coming from. And these, these software developers for the open source programs are not doing it to make a fortune. They're doing it for the love of what they're doing. So I think we ought to support them. And I do. I use a little you know, sort of obscure email program. And so I had to go find another hosting company that would accommodate uh, open source email programming because even if I don't stay with this particular email program, I'm probably always going to stick with the little guys who are developing the open source programs. But this doesn't seem to be working out any better either. And the only emails I am getting are from one of our viewers. Like, this is all the email I am getting from one of our viewers who is not tech savvy. 
And in fact, I strongly suspect, I don't know this for a fact, but I strongly suspect that if he doesn't like what his iPad is doing, he probably just slams it on the desk a couple of times and hopes that improves it. Because, no, technology is not his thing. So how on earth am I getting his emails, but emails from everybody else, you know, from my bank, from, you know, companies I do business with? No, they're not coming through. So if you need to send me an email, at least until this is resolved, and who knows when that's going to happen, um, I'm sick of calling them up and eventually hanging up in frustration. But... Um, I'm going to have to resolve it quickly because it's my email. Uh, in the meantime, if you need to send me something or if you have kitty or puppy pictures or other pretty happy, comforting pictures, I would love to include them. And all you need to do is send them to me, care of my Etsy shop, Sue Me Gifts, and I'll go dig them out. Ordinarily, I don't deal with anything other than Etsy-related emails through that account. But, you know, it is what it is, and I am up to my eyeballs in bizarre nerds with bizarre nerd speak. And frankly, I don't know how much longer I can take this. I think eventually I'm going to just go back to snail mail, stick a stamp on it, because these people speak a totally different language and I have no idea what they have done with all my emails but they have just disappeared into the night. Um, I don't imagine this is a permanent situation. It will get resolved and I will keep you posted. All right, in the meantime, let's take a look at our happy little calm, serene, grounding minute before we leave, and I will see you all here tomorrow.